Hello, everyone, and welcome to Literary Tales. I'm your host, Paul Kraus, and in this episode, we explore the contrast of love, war, sacrifice, and redemption in Shakespeare's Henry V. Shakespeare cannot be separated from the context and the times in which he lived. In 1588, Spain, with the blessing of papal sanction, attempted to conquer England through claims of inheritance and marriage, tying the Habsburg dynasty to the crown and throne of Albion. The Spanish Armada was defeated, and a world historical shift occurred. The New World was no longer going to be the sole domain of the Spanish Habsburgs, but was now open to the Anglo-Saxon and Anglo-Celtic peoples who would bring Protestantism, common law, and the militia tradition of the right to bear arms to the Americas. Henry V was written about a decade after the tumultuous events that preoccupied early modern English civilization. The play may have been about one of England's most beloved kings, but a very close inspection of the play reveals that it is not simply a memoriam to Henry V, but a drama concerning the politics of usurpation and war, the throes of which England had just been under. Elizabethan anxieties and fears over legitimacy, the right of secession, and religious sanction for conquest are all present in the play. The chorus might ask us to imagine the field of Agincourt, since they were incapable of reproducing such a spectacle on stage, yet the chorus's call to Agincourt evokes the very recent memories of the war between England and Spain. Oh, for a muse of fire that would ascend the brightest heaven of invention, a kingdom for a stage, princes to act, and monarchs to behold the swelling scene. Those memories are not set distant in the medieval world, but, as mentioned, very close to home and living memories in the minds for most who would have seen Shakespeare's plays. It is interesting to note, as other Shakespeare scholars of the past have, that there is much irony interwoven into a play about one of England's most celebrated monarchs. Then should warlike Harry, like himself, assume the port of Mars, and at his heels, leashed in like hounds, should famine, sword, and fire crouch for employment. In the choral introduction to Henry V, the chorus sings that Henry will not bring peace, prosperity, and fertility's blessings, but famine, sword, and fire. If the measure of a good ruler is presiding over hearth and home with a hearty fire and good stew, then Henry is no such king. The play opens with the bishops of Canterbury and Eli fretting over a possible church tax. This reflects the angst and anxiety of the clergy and the turmoil of the Reformation. Fearing the loss of their established customs, the churchmen assume the role of conjuring up a justification for war against France, which has long been on the mind of Henry to at least distract his attention from confiscating and ushering in new laws against the church. When Henry gathers with the bishops and they ex exchange the necessary pleasantries, Henry asks the Archbishop of Canterbury to explain why he has claims to the throne of France. Sure, we thank you, my learned Lord, we pray you proceed, and justly and religiously unfold why the law salit that they have in France should or should not bar us in our claim. The Archbishop then gives a long and tedious, and indeed banal speech, about the technicalities of Salic law, in what is one of the most boring and snoozeworthy speeches in the great plays of all of Shakespeare. And Henry, the Flit and Henry V certainly has many memorable speeches. The archbishops is not one of them. And that's the point. The archbishop conjures up the most technical, 
bordering on absurd pretexts for war. But perhaps the most important is when he tells Henry that Salic law forbids a woman from ever inheriting the throne. No woman shall secede in Salic land. The speech by the archbishop reveals the ambiguity and the blending of recent English history with that of medieval memory. The archbishop is analogous to the Bishop of Rome, the Pope, conjuring up the justification for war and regime change. No woman shall succeed in Salic land evokes the complexities and the interweaving of woman, Salic exceptionalism, and religious blessing that was the Spanish Armada and the Habsburg attempt to overthrow a certain woman queen of England. Accepting the archbishop's justification, Henry prepares to awake the sleeping sword of war that will disturb the tranquility of the vineyards and the gardens of the world. After mustering a small invasion force, Henry proceeds to venture deep into Frankish lands to establish his claim to the throne. There is only one image of fruitfulness in the play, at the very beginning when the Bishop of Eli speaks to the Archbishop of Canterbury, that the strawberry grows underneath the nettle, and wholesome berries thrive and ripen best. This tranquil image of serenity will soon be replaced by blood and mud. We must remember that famine, sword, and fire is what Henry unleashes. It is true that Henry V includes, as already mentioned, some of the most sublime of Shakespearean rhetoric. Once more unto the breach, dear friends, and cry God for Harry, England, and St. George are among the most recognizable lines of all Shakespeare. But we shouldn't let the beautiful and moving rhetoric Shakespeare inserts into Henry's persona distract us from the irony that also lies in the same speeches. In the same once more speech that opens the third act of the play, Henry also says, revealingly, Let us swear that you are worth your breeding, which I doubt not. The value of a man here is not in husbandry, but in war, only in war, in bludgeoning a fellow man to death, is a man's worth to be found. The St. Crispin Day's speech continues to unveil this hypermasculine fraud from Shakespeare's perspective. As Henry raises the spirit of the beleaguered and hungry English troops, he extols the reality that they are few in number and therefore that a victory would mean more glory to the happy few. While the other men who remain home in England with wife and children will be forgotten, those who ventured with Harry into France for battle will be remembered for all eternity. The mark of his pride and immortality, won on this St. Crispin's day, will be the scars he shows to the younger generation and his age-old peers who sat out the battle. This, of course, the great masculine fraud unveiled by Homer as much as it is the fraud unveiled by Shakespeare, is what Shakespeare is getting at. War, with its glory and honor to be won, is not the highest reality of life. Love, as Shakespeare will show, is the true blessedness we seek. And we must remember that in Henry V, a play that deals mostly with war, it ends in the sacrament of marriage and love, offering redemption to the hollow and bloodthirsty Henry V as he gallivants through France and war. When the French ambassador arrived earlier in the play to taunt Henry with tennis balls, during which Henry assured him that he would not kill the messenger, as it were, we are told that Henry is a good and pious Christian king. We are no tyrant, but a Christian king, unto whose grace our passion is a subject, as is our wretches fettered in our prisons. Here we again find more irony and the intrusion of the Anglo-Spanish War into the play. Henry declares himself a Christian king. In comparison to what? A non-Christian king? Of course, that is the argument that Philip II made against Elizabeth. 
Henry's declaration of being just and graceful, a good king, implying compassion, is subsequently juxtaposed with wretches fettered in our prisons. An image of tyranny is placed side by side with the claim of not being a tyrant. Injustice is just opposed against justice. Harry declares himself a just king, yet the next line talks about wretches fettered in prisons. War unleashes the barbarism of Henry that we already see in between the lines in some of his statements. And this is more fully manifested as Henry conquers town after town. How yet resolves the governor of the town? He asks the besieged French garrison. This is the latest parley, we will admit. Therefore, to our best mercy give yourselves, or like men proud of destruction, defy us to our worst. For as I am a soldier, a name that in my thoughts become me best, if I begin the battle cry once more, I will not leave the half-achieved her floor, till in her ashes she lied bury. The gates of mercy shall be shut up, and the flesh soldier, rough and hard of heart, in liberty of blood, hand shall range, with conscience wide as hell, mowing like grass, your fresh fair virgins, and your flowering infants. In this remarkable speech by Henry to the French townsmen, we see the nakedness of his warring pathos. Harry is willing to slay virgin woman and child if the town does not capitulate. Likewise, we see once more the masculine fraud. Men can only be men in death and war, as he taunts the French soldiers, at once offering them the mercy of surrender, yet goading them into battle to prove their manliness. Or, like men proud of destruction, defy us to our worst. So much for the merciful and graceful Christian king he claimed to be earlier in the play. Yet we see the other side of Harry, the human side, when he is with Catherine at the end of the play. War, Shakespeare is telling us, especially in the name of political conquest, what we call regime change today, barbarizes us. It causes us to be tyrants. Love, or at least the hope of love, by contrast, humanizes us and offers us the prospect of redemption. After winning the improbable victory at Agincourt, much like the English winning against the much larger Spanish fleet in the English Channel just a decade before the premiere of Henry V on stage, we see a different Henry as he begins to court his bride. The war acts, the third and the fourth, give closer inspection to the person of Henry than the first and the second acts. His psychology is revealed as we learn his anxieties over his tenuous and fragile rule inherited by his father and from his stark brutalism in threatening to wipe out entire villages and their non-combatant populations. In the final act, with Princess Kate, however, Henry is metamorphosized into a more tender, compassionate, and wholesome individual. No longer beset by the lust to seize the French crown, and instead intent on winning the heart and affection of Kate, Henry lets go of his imperial ambitions to rise into the flower of the white rose instead. The meeting of Henry and Kate face to face as subject creatures of affectivity brings the peace the chorus was hoping for in the prologue to Act Three. The bravado of Henry is humbled by the appearance of Catherine. He is brought low by falling in love with her, as she reminds him when she speaks to him with ironic closure. The Henry of the sword, whom we see nakedly revealed in Acts 3 and 4, is transfigured by his encounter with love in Act 5. O oh, fair Catherine, if you will love me soundly with your French heart, I will be glad to hear you confess it, brokenly with your English tongue. An angel is like you, Kate, and you are like an angel. 
While Kate is confused and blushing, manifesting my new signs of life, instead of the pale faces of death and war, Henry doesn't mince words about his affection for her. Henry here offers no great speech, no unto the breach, no cry God for Harry, no band of brothers can be conjured out of the love-struck heart and tongue of the king. I know no way to mince it in love, but directly to say, I love you, he exclaims to Kate. There are, then, two Henrys that appear in the play upon closer inspection. There is the Henry of the sword and the Henry of love. The more endearing, indeed transfigured ruler is the Henry of love that appears at the end of the play. Given that we have just seen the bloody mess of Agincourt, the ending of Henry V is hopeful in its closure in marriage. The prospects of prosperity, which has thus far eluded Henry and the whole of England, are now tied entirely to the blissful and blessed marriage between he and Kate. Prepare we for our marriage, on which day my lord Burgundy will take your oath, and all the peers, for surety of our leagues, then shall I swear to Kate, and you to me, and may our oaths well kept and prosperous be. As the chorus closes, the play we are reminded, Henry loses France, and he caused England to bleed. But despite that, he found solace, serenity, and peace. We might say he found salvation in Kate. The drama of war that was so near to Shakespeare and the farce of bloody manhood and political scheming come to the fore in Henry V. War brings distrust, deceit, murder, hangings, scars, and famine. The sword of war unleashed in the lust for power, manifesting itself in attempts at political usurpation, makes villains of us all and awakens the hounds of famine, sword, and fire to sweep over the fair and plentiful world we inhabit. The wisdom of Shakespeare is in his exposing the naked horror of war wrought by political ambitions, and how it is countered not by more political calculation, but by the encounter and flourishing of love. Like all great poets who write about love, Shakespeare, in many of his war plays, and especially here in Henry V, shows us the true power, the redemptive quality, and the serenity brought by love. The Henry of the sword is not much better than other villains, say like Richard III. The barbarous Henry in Acts 1, 2, 3, and 4 of his play are transformed at the end in Act 5 through his encounter with Kate and their blessed union together. But the Henry of love is still open for those sorry souls who have dwelled in the blood and mud of war and political ambition. They will have to lose France if they are to gain angels. Shakespeare heals the world destroyed by politics, not by offering a political solution, but by a far more human and interior solution, the encounter with love.